back in Belfast, Colonel Kerr and his unit were not alone in colluding with loyalist murder gangs. The police colluded with them too. <laughs> there was a bang from the hallway. My father jumped up and slammed the door shut while my mother ran behind him and hit the uh, personal attack button. The next thing I remember is being on the floor against the wall in the corner. Uh, holding my younger brother and sister and shots going off very loud and it seemed like forever. Pat Finucan was a solicitor. Many of his clients were IRA men. The loyalists claimed he was too. Both the IRA and his family categorically denied this. It's an insult an egregious insult. It was easy for them to believe that he was a member of the IRA. Their limited mentalities did not stretch to uh, differentiating between the rule of the lawyer and uh, the offence suspected of the client. Uh, the, 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 the line between the two was not apparent to them. The line became irrelevant to this man, Ken Barrett, one of the killers the agent Brian Nelson worked closely with, Ken Barrett shot Pat Finucane, and he gave us details about the weapons used. No one knows this, right? Because everybody thinks he was hit by a magnum. It was a 38 special with magnum rounds. Magnum rounds, you remember that. Barrett says the plan to shoot Pat Finucane was suggested to him by this man in red, Jim Spence. Spence is the classic godfather. He organized killings behind the scenes without getting his own hands dirty, as Barrett explained to us. If you understand what I mean, he wasn't actually involved in the business end. Okay. Do you understand what well, I mean? He, he, he would have arranged, if you know what I mean? or mm -hmm. set it up, mm -hmm. but he wasn't actually involved okay. in the actual the execution, the end product, if you, if you get what I mean. What Barrett says about Spence organizing the end product in the Fanukan case is reinforced by the Secret Army records. They report it was Spence who suggested the loyalists attack Fanukan. But when Jim Spence first came up with the idea, Ken Barrett thought he was crazy. I says, look, what a tell you, Jim. I says, you can't start whacking fucking solicitors here. I says, you'll bring the painters down on us like a bag of fucking shape full of no guns. I says, they'll raid everywhere. I says, they'll take the fucking place apart and start hitting these people. I says, because they'll know who it came from. They'll know who's involved right away. Barrett was right. They did. Gunmen walked into Pat Finnegan's home at Fort William. The special branch knew the names of Barrett and the other gunman within days. Neither was ever arrested. The head went down. I wasn't arrested for The special branch is the hidden intelligence gathering arm of the police in Belfast. Their job is to give leads from informants to the ordinary detectives trying to solve murders like Pat Finucane's. But they operate in the shadows, an all-powerful, unaccountable force within a force. Although Special Branch knew Ken Barrett had killed Pat Finucane, they withheld this from the detectives investigating his murder. I was heading the Patrick Finucane investigation. I didn't get a great deal of help now from Special Branch. And I had 20 detectives, uh, very, very good detectives, uh, running about North Belfast trying to pick up leads uh, on this case. Did you get any steers on any of the key suspects? No leads, no, no, no directions at all really from them, which was quite unusual. But two years later, 
one of Detective Superintendent Simpson's officers did learn all about Barrett. On the 3rd of October 1991, at Barrett's request, a Detective Sergeant, Johnston Brown, met him in a car. Barrett was offering his services as an informer. So, I asked him, who murdered Mr. Finnick? And he replied straight back, hypothetically, me. So, I mean, if he had a slap in the face, he couldn't have got my attention quicker. According to Detective Sergeant Brown, Barrett then described in detail how he'd shot the solicitor. I remember turning around in the car and looking at him. And he, he was sitting with his hands and his eyes blazing, just... Pump, pump, pump. He put his hands down into the footwell of the car and he was holding an imaginary gun. And you could see where he was discharging the gun into Mr. Flugan's head. He, he was reliving it. It was actually happening again to him. By his very actions, he was expressing how he had enjoyed it. He was boasting about it, gloating over it. And he said that uh, as he was pumping the bullets into this man's face, they were coming back up by the stone floor. And he was still dodging them in the car because he was reliving this trauma. There was no doubt about it. And when he sat back in the chair, he said, That's nothing I say is evidence here. He's right. Barrett was right because the confession was not taken under police caution. Nevertheless, it was a starting point in getting him locked up for murder, which is how Detective Sergeant Brown saw it. But with him in the car was a special branch officer. He made it clear. There's nothing new here. We know he done it. We know. We even know he done it. Move away from it. Move I, away from it. Move away. Killer and what Special Branch wanted, Special Branch got. What's your view about the fact that again the Special Branch didn't avail themselves of that opportunity that was staring them in the face? I just can't comprehend their thinking. I'm uh, uh, appalled at what happened. They said at the inquest uh, into Mr. Finnegan that the killers had killed before. So here was an opportunity to take probably a serial killer off the streets. Detective Sergeant Brown kept meeting Barrett to try to get more evidence out of him. But the branch said these meetings had to cease. Extraordinarily, it was from Barrett that he learned about their next step. He said that he'd been in the car with a number of special branch officers who sat with him and told him that I was treading on too many toes, that I was to be removed from the Belfast region, that they were going to put a threat on me. Who was going to put a threat? Special in? branch. Ken Barrett told you that there was going to be a threat against your life? Yes. A murderer tells me that my colleagues are going to rid themselves of me out of Belfast because I'm treading on toes. Three days later, what Barrett had warned would happen, did happen. A detective chief superintendent said that a serious loyalist threat had been received by Special Branch, that my life was in danger. The threat was a threat to your family? A threat to my life and the lives of my family, yes, indeed. Purportedly from a loyalist source? Yes, indeed. Received no. by a special branch? Yes, indeed. Coming a few days after Barrett himself had predicted that exactly what was going to happen? Yes. That wasn't a coincidence? They would say it was, but no. Detective Sergeant Brown took this threat seriously and finally backed off. John Stevens, who's the Deputy John Commissioner Stevens, of the Metropolitan Police, says he's There, the matter rested for another seven years until the IUC were forced to have outsiders investigate once again. For clarity, I will refer to this investigation that we start today as Stevens III. John Stevens had already twice investigated security force links in the Finucane murder, first in 1989, then in 1993. Now, for the third time in ten years, he was back in Belfast. I've assembled 20 
detectives, an independent team of investigators, with current and former officers from the Metropolitan Police Service and the Northumbria Police. An early visitor to the new Stevens inquiry was Detective Sergeant Johnston Brown, which was when the threats to him from his colleagues in Special Branch began all over again. I was uh, confronted by a Special Branch colleague. He says, if we put a barrier up, or an obstacle up, be like the rest of them. Don't go over it or around it. Th- go away. He says, you walked into the offices of English detectives and you spoke about us and you think there's no comeback. You think there's no retribution. You listen to me. And he lost it. He threatened me. He said that we'll send our ninja men in to your house. There's not a lock that we can't get past. And they come out of your loft with a wee bag, he says. With a couple of dirty LVF guns in it. Loyalist guns? Yes. Loyalist volunteer force. Now, I knew, but I could see his eyes bulging, his neck bulging, and his very demeanour. He meant this. It was such a confrontation I shall never forget. And he said, they come down to that loft with these guns. Are they yours, don't they? Maybe they're, are they your sons? think about that. Detective Sergeant Brown gave a statement to the Stevens inquiry that there was a tape of Barrett's confession to the murder of Pat Finucane. This had been secretly recorded by the branch at Brown's first meeting with Barrett on the 3rd of October 1991. Stevens asked the branch for the tape and a tape labelled the third was handed over. But when Stevens played it back they thought Brown had been wasting their time. Once I'd made the sit and signed it, they told me there was no confession. They the had third. on the tape. Yes, they asked me, was an audio tape not a record that you couldn't question? Independent audio record of what was said. And I said, well, my notes are here and uh, that's the best. That's all I can do. Although the special branch had labelled the tape the third, it was in fact a tape of a second meeting Brown had had with Barrett on the 10th. The same branch officer had been present and the questions had been identical, almost. Mr. Barrett was repeatedly saying, what's he asked me that for? What's he asked me? We went over this last week. It's gone over the same ground. It's gone over the same ground. And uh, I don't know, I was sitting as perplexed as he was. So your special branch colleague was asking exactly the same questions that you had asked the previous week yes with the one exception the murder of Mr. Finnegan out what's now clear is that the tape of the 10th had been relabeled the 3rd and that the meeting of the 10th had been a set up by the branch to recreate the official record of the 3rd but with Barrett's murder confession erased why would the special branch want to wipe any evidence, remove any evidence of there having been a confession to the Vanukin murder. All I can do is Why would they want to do that? I can't answer for Special Branch. I have asked them time and time and time again. And I haven't got any answers from them. And I don't expect to get any answers from them. Are you asking me, am I surprised that they, that this happened? No, I'm not. The official special branch record of Ken Barrett's confession to the murder of Patrick Finucane may have disappeared, but at least there is now a record, our tapes, and they run to many hours. These tapes may help explain why the special branch went to such extraordinary lengths to prevent Ken Barrett from being brought to justice. Barrett says he was encouraged to shoot Pat Finucane by a police officer. This officer, he says, tried to convince him the solicitor was in the IRA. When you met him first time, what did he actually say to you about Finucane? Just that Pat was one of their men, you know, was an IRA man, and he was dealing with finances and stuff for him, and he was a bad boy, and if he was out, like, would have a lot of trouble replacing him, stuff like this, you know. Barrett also told us that the police officer assisted his murder gang. 
An hour before the murder, soldiers and policemen had been searching lock-up garages for weapons near the solicitor's home. Barrett says a message was relayed from the officer via a call box close to where Barrett and his fellow gunmen were waiting. The roadblock had been taken down. Mm -hmm. And that's what this guy was telling you. The roadblock had gone. All clear. Okay. That man. There's no, say, presence in the area, you know what I mean? Now, you couldn't phone me and say everything's clear. Unless you know where the police are at that particular time. It's a brave drive. Barrett also says the loyalist godfather, Jim Spence, who wanted the solicitor shot, had introduced him to this police officer. He says, you're more, well, how do you put it? He says, you're more the psychopath of what Spence is. He says, you're more one for business here, aren't you? I says, what do you mean business? He says, no, you won. Pro wish Barry. I says, ah, oh, what's it? He says, he says, understand what's not. I says, yes, every time. I says, you do the business for us. If in the near future we can help you at any stage, that'll be done. He says, yes. As long as we're on the same way. Over the years, Spence and his police friend have stayed tuned. In the summer of 1999, the police set out at dawn to bring Spence and Barrett in for questioning by the Stevens Inquiry. It was 6 a.m but Spence was already dressed and sipping a cup of tea. He'd been tipped off. Barrett says he was tipped off too. He just says to me, if you want to give your man a ring, he'll let you know the ins and outs. I rang him, he rang me the next day. They thought that surprised that we would have. When they were arrested, Meg went out to get into the car. He said, well, did you know you were getting arrested this morning? I said, what makes you think that? He says, you're going to look very surprised to see us. He let you know. Jim Spence is one of Belfast's untouchables. The police know he's organized murders, but he's never spent a day in jail for this. The protective arm of Spence and his police and murder gang associates extends to everyone involved in Pat Finucane's murder, provided they play the game. Billy Stoby didn't. He was a weak link in the chain. He told us Spence asked him to produce guns for Pat Finucane's murder. I was told to get two 9mm Brennings. By whom? By Spence. When? I seen Spence on the Tuesday night. Right. right. And then I took uh, a 9mm Browning and a hacker and cut. And the conversation was that uh, I need two 9mm Brownings that the hacker and cut only carries 10 shots and the 9mm Browning carries 13. Billy Stoby was charged with Pat Finucane's murder by the Stevens Inquiry. When we talked to him at his home on the Fourth River Estate, he was awaiting trial. Not much moves on this bleak loyalist stronghold without Jim Spence knowing about it. Sounds like this fucking cracking up. Is he going to the roof? He phoned me. He says, you know where I'm working with fuckers are? I says, hey. He says, you're mad from one another. I says, no. He says, there's still, he says. Stoby did live to see his trial, but only just. The Red Hand Defenders have said they carried out the murder of William Stoby. Billy Stoby talked too much, not just to me, but to several others. In the Fourth River area of North Belfast early this morning. One weak link down, and one to go. Spence suspected Ken Barrett was talking to us. Graffiti appeared, mocking him as a one-time police informer. Barrett knew his days were numbered. Barrett went on the run. He flew to Birmingham, where we met him, and again secretly filmed him. Clutching his belongings in just a plastic bag, Barrett explained why he thought he and Stoby had become scapegoats for Spence and his police friends. Killing, apart from again, was organized by the police. The dogs in the street and all everybody knew. They set the murder up. They wanted Finnegan dead. 
Barrett again spoke of the police officer he says Spence introduced him to, how the police had urged loyalists to shoot the solicitor, and how this officer had appealed to him in person to do it. They know who killed Patrick. They orchestrated it from the start. Barrett says he never knew the real name of this police officer. But we do, and we have established that he was a member of Special Branch based in Belfast, here at Castle Ray. We also know a bit about his past. Reliable police sources have provided us with evidence that this officer urged a loyalist gunman to shoot a suspected IRA man in 1990. Which is what Barrett said the officer urged him to do a year earlier to Pat Fanuka. But now the man who'd killed him was in fear of his own life, in fear of the very people who'd set up the murder in the first place. Barrett had nowhere left to run. There's no heroes at this fucking day. You're buying them on there. You're talking about the Wednesday the drinking stops on the Friday. What would you do, John, honestly? What Barrett wasn't going to do was hand himself over to the Stevens inquiry. You know what they'll do me? What? What? They'll charge me. They'll, they'll charge me and they'll stand by him. And believe me, John. So Barrett took his chances and flew back to Northern Ireland, lying low at this hotel in Balamine. One day, he found it surrounded by armed police. Yeah, Miss Peter, Detective Chief Inspector Sunday, phoned the hotel room. Says I need to speak to you. I says, what's it regarding? He says, your personal safety. He says, I only intend staying in Balamina. I says, I don't know. He says, well, I don't advise you to stay here too long. Ken Barrett thought the threat was from his own side, from Jim Spence and the murder gangs he once worked with. And so it was. What Barrett didn't know was that they'd learned the location of the hotel he was hiding at from a police officer. I understand that Barrett had telephoned the officer seeking his advice about what to do next. It's alleged that the officer then tipped off Barrett's former friends who wanted him dead. Barrett was being burned by both sides, his own and a renegade officer from a force that had protected him from prosecution for so long. There was only one place left to run. England. And the Stevens Inquiry, who were investigating the darker forces of the state. Can I ask you about the Special Branch? Are, are they a significant part of your inquiry? Are they indeed at the heart of your inquiry? The Special Branch, the Army through organization and all parts of the security apparatus are at the very heart of our investigation. The heart of that security apparatus is MI5, supposedly the eyes and ears of Whitehall. <coughs> MI5 has operated extensively in Northern Ireland. Twelve years ago, when John Stevens set foot there, MI5 signed statements to say they knew virtually nothing about collusion. That was quite simply untrue. We understand that almost everything we've disclosed in our two programs about army and police complicity with loyalist murder gangs was known to MI5 at the time. Why? Because MI5 had direct access to all the Army's damning secret files on a daily basis. What's more, we understand that MI5 has a crucial piece of intelligence that does suggest the police were involved in the murder of Pat Fanukin. I'm told that this intelligence is consistent with Ken Barrett's account to us of police assistance in the murder. And yet it's only recently that this vital information was handed over to the Stevens inquiry. In other words, it's taken 12 years and three major police inquiries to get it out of MI5. Just one question, if I may, about the security service. I understand that MI5 were aware of Nelson's illegal activities and that they also knew about the role of the police in the Pat Panukin murder. What's your, what's your response to that? I've got no comment at that. Uh, we're still pursuing the, the inquiry. We've still got people to interview. We've still got people to re-interview on the inquiry. And we'll continue to do that until I'm satisfied we've got to the bottom of what took place. So have you got questions for the security service? We, uh, we must aware we've got questions for everybody in relation to that. I don't think my family should have been made to wait 13 years. I don't think all of the other families 
the exact number of whom is yet to be determined uh, should be made to wait this length of time for proper answers. But many of the answers are still buried in the darkest recesses of the state. Like the names of those who used and protected the men who pulled the trigger. I don't think about them terribly much. I think about the people behind them. Um, and they have no face and they have no persona and they, they exist only perhaps in the shape of a bureaucratic suit. But they're there and I'm determined to make them accountable.